Okay, Johnny Wonder here, Golf WRX. I am here with 2016 U.S. Mid Amateur Champion and 2017 Walker Cup player, Masters Low Am, everything else, probably one of the top amateurs still to this day, lifetime amateur in the country. It's a pride, the pride of Newport Beach, California, Stuart Hagstead, Stu. <laughs> the mean streets of Newport. <laughs> Welcome to this Zoom chat during uh, Corona lockdown. Yeah, during quarantine. Yeah, happy to be here. Thanks for thinking that I could add value to this. <laughs> well, this is Thank you. This is the whole point. And this is it's Masters week and we're not playing golf this week. So it's, you know, it's it's bizarro world. Well, for for in Seinfeld, this is just weird. But, you know, you have a you have a unique experience in a, yeah. in a casual group, right? I I think I think the easiest way to describe this and it's just follow me with this, right? So growing up in Southern California and playing in Southern California Golf Association events, you, you grow up playing against kids, you know, Brandon Hagee, Max Homa, uh, Xander Schauffele, Patrick Cantlay, Bo Hostler, like Walker Cuppers, right. you know, Michael Wheat. Like you go down this list of guys and it's like, you got to flat bring it, right? right? So, and I love the MGA. I love everything, how they run tournaments. And I love the courses that you play at. And I love everything about that golf association i'm still very close with a lot of the guys that are there but and to their credit the players are exceptionally accomplished but when i went back there and it was probably like you know a huge benefit for for me not knowing any better you know coming out of college um when i went to go back to work in, in the city but you know you have your morgan hoffman's and your andrews Pavodas, and you know certainly like you know i have a great group that i mean you know, Trevor Randolph and, you know, Joe Saladino, George Zaringer, you know, you have all these guys that are studs in their own right, but like they don't come around quite as often. Right. So my mentality with it was like, if, you know, if you could kind of grow up playing against all these elite players, you could go back there and, you know, you could play well, if nothing else, like kind of see where your game's at, you at least aren't intimidated by anyone. Right. Sure. So you, you bring that, you know, to, you know, say a PGA tour event or, or, you know, the masters in this case. And, um, you know, I was kind of told myself, you know, that, you know, you were just as good as any of those guys, you know, when you're playing your best or, you know, you'd been around guys and so on and kind of exactly what you just said, right? Like you wouldn't be like intimidated or out of place, but when you step on the range with guys you've looked up to your entire life, like right. icons of the sport and idols of yours since you've started swinging a club, you know, Ernie Els and um, Tiger didn't play my year, but, you know, Phil Mickelson, um, Adam Scott, you know, Matt Kuchar. I mean, just go down the list, you know, right. let alone some of the new guys, you know, that are younger. And I wasn't as blown away by like the Justin Thomases and the Jordan Spees because I played junior golf against them and played college golf against them. Right. But when you're hitting balls next to like, I mean, even the older guard, you know, like Angel Cabrera, Steve Stricker, um, I mean, Marco Mir, like just guys like that. I mean, they're, they're Hall of Famers. See, that's, and, that's where I'd get funky is not the kids, even me. Like, if I walked in the range right now, if I saw Justin Thomas, I'd be like, oh, cool, it's Justin Thomas. If I saw, like, right. Fred Cup, Freddie Couple. Yeah, Fred Couple, oh, exactly. like, I'd be like, And you know him because you play at the ditch, but, like, you know. I've never played with him, but, yeah, I've hit balls with Freddie, and, yeah, you're right. I'd, I'd, exactly. lose my, I'd lose my shit. Like, Davis loves something like that. I'm like, oh, my God. <laughs> I'm like, what are you doing here? <laughs> yeah, like, it's, 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 it's um, again, like, I mean, the easiest way to put it, put it is, you know, it's guys you've looked up to your whole life, let alone, you know, from my side of it, you know, as a younger guy, I was 25 at the time. And, you know, you look up to these guys that are better members and, you know, guys that are helping around the range and the tournament and guys that are just titans of industry. And, um, you know, I've been fortunate to, to get to know a couple of them, you know, a little better just through travels. And, you know, some of them are pretty involved in the Walker Cup and stuff like that. But, you know, at the time, it's, it's, it's almost um, kind of introspective. It's like, oh, my gosh, like we – it's literally the epitome of, like, being thrown in the deep end. So, um, no, it was, it was a very stressful week from, from that side of it. I mean, obviously, like, huge in the sense of just, you know, as an experience. Like, there's, there's no downside, so to speak. Like, you always want to test yourself against the world's best. Right. But, um, yeah, no, it's, it's, it's basically everyone you've looked up to and every facet of your life at the same time and it's like sensory overload so right for sure okay so we're going to get to the titans of the industry thing because obviously the people that mix at augusta national it's an interesting bunch we're going to get to that in a second um and and now you know at some point i'm going to have you on my podcast and talk about just literally about the last six holes of your u.s mid-am match 
<laughs> because to me, and I'm not blowing smoke up your ass, besides Tiger in 2008, uh, it was probably the best, most exciting hour and a half, two hours of golf that I've seen in a USJ event. It probably lasts 15 or 20 years. Like you came, you came out of the pit of hell. And and he didn't play and he didn't play that bad either. As a, as I, a, I remember bits and pieces of it, but I don't remember the whole thing. I um, you know, people talk about being in the zone, so to speak, and you know how everything becomes like very simple and you know kind of reactionary. Um, I mean, I'll, I'm happy to talk about it later, but yeah, I really I don't remember a whole lot of it. Well, you played really well, so. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and the other guy didn't play that bad either, which was the, which made it more exciting. The guy, Harvest the beast. Yeah, he, didn't, he didn't fall apart. Okay, so I want to do this, and I've always wanted to do this to somebody who played in the Masters. So we're gonna take, so we're gonna go on the step by step. You show up to Augusta when? Week of Augusta. The I think it was the Thursday before. Okay, and did you get the opportunity as a participant to go earlier than that for a practice round? After yeah, your yes. okay, and when did you do yeah, that? You, so you get five rounds, or sorry, five days. And I mean, you can play, you know, 72 a day if you want. Right. Um, but you get five days not with members. So I was fortunate enough to take my five days. And then I, I we know a few members um, from Los Angeles. So we were fortunate enough to go with them. So um, from a prepared standpoint, because um, a lot of the boys on tour, especially, you know, they're, they're playing every week and, you know, they're, they're traveling to, to tour events and, um, you know, it's, it's challenging to kind of carve out a couple of days amongst events and sponsors obligations and whatever. And so right. Yeah. So I, um, you know, I, long story short, I, I had the chance, I probably played it. I'd say between 12 and 14 times. Okay. And that's, that's, guess. that's over the course of about seven or eight. Well, you knew you were going, that's over the course of what, nine months. I yeah yeah so we'll uh we'll shoot um August yeah, I, August I got the call no I was in se September yeah I was in September I got the call like early October you know that it was okay to to come out and they kind of told me about it you had five months uh, yeah but I never went in 2016 I okay. only did it in 17 I only did it in the spring Okay, so so oh, so you packed it all in from like from like the beginning of March until the tournament happened. You packed all your golf into those. I played the state team, okay. uh, country club of Birmingham, and then I didn't touch a golf club for like two months. Wow. Besides Thanksgiving, I guess when I played with my dad and brothers. Okay, so so you played it. You're you know the golf course. So the shell shock of seeing Augusta for the first time is gone. You're there Thursday. Second time. I, I actually had the chance to play at my senior year of college. We did a trip down with the team because our athletic director um, is a member. And we, we went down. And at that point, that was – I uh, I mean, I'd tell the story now. Like, I, you know, we, we played 18 in the morning. I actually had the chance, and I've told them this. Um, they put the two seniors out, and one of the guys that was helping to host my senior year was Jeff Knox. Mm -hmm. and, and the other senior, Sam Smith, and I, we played with Jeff in my first round at Augusta. Wow. And it was like, I still like vividly remember it was cold and I think there was a frost delay. And on four, which is like 235, Jeff hit like five wood and this thing was just a rope, like right at it, 12 feet. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is so cool. I can like barely make, you know, contact off the club base. And, um, and then that afternoon I went and played the back nine and shot 32 and then went into the clubhouse and had an azalea and played the par three course and i was like this is i just coolest, died coolest I, just, ever. I just died cool yeah. stay <laughs> like we're done here we're right, done We've right. yeah. yeah so um yeah what's, and then i'll just really, really quick what's he what's he like jeff knox he's awesome i mean i, I know his son pretty well because we're the same age in school he played at alabama um, I've had the chance to, to see Jeff at a handful of other things. Um, you know, he played in the crump one year and, uh, I think he played the Jones cup the year that, that, that I played. Um, I mean, he's just, he's really sweet. You know, he's just, um, obviously a, a heck of a player, super accomplished, but, um, he, uh, yeah, he's, he's, he's great. He's a, and I, he's a good person. I, he's a really good guy. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So Okay, so let's let's start going through tournament time. So Thursday, 
you show up. So you have a week before you actually tee off for real. So you get there, you rent a house with who? Who are you staying with? Your family? So Thursday night, I you don't, stayed you, in the you don't, clubhouse. Are you, oh, they let you check in. So they let you check in right when you get in. You can go to the crow's nest right away. I came down with a member. Okay. So I, uh, I stayed in the clubhouse. I actually wasn't in the crow's nest. Ever? Um, no, I spent Monday night there. I spent Monday night after the amateur dinner there. Just for shits and and, and people and a lot of people sit there. You know, um, like I know Shackleford's pretty bullish on you know having the amateurs stay there, you know, for all um, you know the whole week. And listen, it's it's a very it's a very special room. Um, it's a very special place in in golf. Um, it's it's literally well, you can feel it. You can you can it's different. You can sense it. Right. Um, but you know you're you don't know how many chances you're going to get. You know to to play in the masters. And it's not just that. I mean, it's a, it's a special time for you and your family and you want to kind of relive it. You know, it's not just about you. It's about everyone else as well. And I mean, it's a lot of it's about you, but at the sure. same, like, you know, you want it, like, I, you, I get it. Yeah. Like you wouldn't be there if it wasn't for people that had supported you. And um, not to mention, and again, you know, I'm six, five and a lot of those beds are, are for, are for know, guys are, like me. It's, 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 yeah. Are a little, are a little shorter. And, <laughs> Um, there were, I mean, there were five of us up in the room and, you know, you just, I don't know. I, I, I just, I, I felt, um, like giving up anything to have not stayed there for the whole week, if that makes sense. Yeah. You got a night in. Okay. I, I get you. Okay. Yeah. No, so... it was very special. I'll remember it forever. I had a cocktail and watched, you know, the NCAA championships, Jim Nance, you know, was calling it. Right. Yeah. It was an amazing night. It was great. Okay. So, so, okay. So then we're going to get to. Let's just get to when the tournament sort of opens. So it's Monday. So I want to get what I'm trying to get to is I'm trying to get to that point where you I'll give show you, up. I'll give, you, I'll, I'll give you Sunday because Sunday is pretty. Well, actually, I mean, shoot, the whole week is so cool. Right. Um, I mean, take, take I'll, I'll, I'll quickly kind of run through it and wrap through it. So I played Friday, um, just kind of casually, you know, had lunch practice, pretty mellow. Guys are beginning to filter in, but not really. Um, Saturday, I hit balls for a bit and then I was just going to go play nine and just go kick it. And, um, and Hideki was on the range <laughs> and I, and we're like the same age. And, right. um, so I went over to him and I was like, Hey, there was like a language barrier. And I was like, I'm just going to play nine. I don't know if you have any interests. Like, I have no idea what you like. It was a total shot in the dark. Right. And I was like, no, no, no. And, um, and I was like, okay, not, Hey, no worries. So I go over, I was going to go play nine, have lunch, then kind of practice and just do my thing. And I was in the putting green and I was like getting ready to go play nine. And this caddy um, comes running back and sees me on the putting green. And um, he's like, Hey, there's a few members that are going to go out and play nine. I don't know what your plan is. Like, you know, you can go ahead, you can go behind, you can join them. And I was like, no, like, I'd love to play with them. Like, it right. sounds awesome. Like, I've, sure. you know, absolutely. So he begins to walk away and I was like, Hey, just, if you don't mind if I ask, like, you know, who is in that group, just so I can like mentally prepare myself. Right. And uh, and he's like, well, it's Craig Heatley, and Mark McKinley, and Condoleezza Rice. And I was like, <laughs> cool. <laughs> Great. Uh, I'd be shit in my pants. Okay, keep going. So um, no, I, I mean that's you know we it was very nice, and um, I mean two great guys, and Dr. Rice was was incredible, and maybe the smartest person I've ever met in my life. It was wild. Like some people think they're well-read, like, you know, like Nico, right? Like, he knows like right. four languages and he's so well-traveled. Like, he ain't Condoleezza Rice though. It's, it's, yeah. I mean, Sorry, it's Nico. so, and then, you know, Craig um, kind of ran all the media that week. And I, I've been fortunate to see, you know, Mr. McKinley a couple of times that he's very supportive of the Walker cup and um, you know, it was, it was cool. So, um, so we did that. And then Sunday I had the chance to play, um, with a member and a close friend of his, um, who's, you know, stays at his house when, when he's in LA and that was Ben Crenshaw. And then Carl Jackson came out and he kind of made some notes in my book, you know, similar to, um, to Jordan, you know, what he did for him. Yeah. And Jordan did a little better than, than me on a scorecard, but you know, I, I'd like to think I did okay. Um, you know, a huge part of that was, was thanks to Carl. And, um, I mean, he deserves a tremendous amount of, praise for the help he gave me that week but well you uh who, who did caddy for you 
I had uh, John Doherty, JD. So he okay. was on the bag for me during the mid-am. And um, so JD went down, we'd made a trip together. And then during every practice round, um, you know, I, I used a guy named John Chance, who's a, who's a caddy down there full time. He was actually on the bag for Haley Moore during the women's amateur last year. Okay. So that's been, he's been cool to follow him and, um, you know, just he's had a lot of success, you know, which is, right. he was amazing. Same thing. I couldn't have played as well as I did without just some of his insight. Um, but yeah, no, JD was on the bag. So let me ask you this question. I've always wondered this. I've watched the masters. I know the golf course inside and out from watching it on TV. I've never played it. And I've never been there. You were sort of um, the same. For the record, like, I'm just as much of a fan and armchair quarterback as you are. I'm right there sure. with you, man. But you've never – but you've played it, and you played in the tournament. So what, what about that golf course surprised you? Like, whenever I ask some people, I'll be like, what, what surprised you about Augusta? Everybody says how hilly it is. Oh, God, it's so hilly. 18 straight up the hills. Like, okay, great. I've heard that 100 times. But every <laughs> once in a while, some people will say, like, um, you know, they'll bring up, they'll bring up a, like, a, a second shot or a – you know, a, a tee shot. They might say, like, you know, the tee shot on two is this, or the tee shot, you know, it, it just what, where were you shocked in some of the shots that you had to hit that were different than what you envisioned from what you saw on TV? I think the two things that just like immediately stick out in my mind is one, you don't have to hit a draw. Okay. Like, you, you don't, like, it helps, sure. Like, if you have a big 330 eight yard draw like Rory has like yeah that's very helpful but right. you don't but you don't have to like it draws like you can the only hole you really kind of have to hit a draw in my opinion is 10 just to get just to get it running down the hill because you're looking at like four or five iron to a green that's firmer probably from the rough so you're probably not going to be able to stop it very right. well if at all you know versus like seven or eight iron if you get a good one okay I mean, it's just like, it's, I don't want us to call it like half a shot or anything like that, but it's, it's a, if you give yourself, you know, four of one versus four of the other, other, like over the course of the week, like just the stress and percentages, like that's, it's going to help you. Okay. Like you don't like, like you don't have to hit a draw on 13. Like you can hit, you can blow it. To, you can blow it. If you hit it straight, I put it in the pine straw two days. But you, but you, but you can play it out of the playing straw from there. Oh yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, it's a. I don't want to say it's a thoughtless layup because, like, there's obviously like you know certain angles and things that are very helpful, you know, to to kind of attack certain pins. But that's a like that second shot's not easy. I mean, if you have four or five you're, iron, you're also like this, aren't you? Aren't you on sort of yeah, a side hill? yeah, totally. And you know, if you if you go left, like stuff can happen and. I have a lower trajectory, so like your margin for error is just not super high, right? Or no, there's no, there's not a ton of margin for error. That's what I meant to say. Um, it's very, it's very not easy, but it's very doable to leave yourself like a 15 footer for birdie if you lay up. But okay. and like that's and that's stress free, right? Like if you elect to lay up, but at the same time, like you just bring in more it's 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 kind of like a a risk factor of you know risk mitigation like you know how much risk are you comfortable taking on and like i mean sure you can take that chance of you know trying to turn it around the corner but like if you don't like, all i'm trying to say is like if you played that whole i think i played it in two under like it's not terrible like i mean you know guys that are beasts with the driver right you know that sling it you know rory's got that super controlled draw you know bubba obviously hits a nice fade um, like you can play that all and you can go out and play it great, but you know, it was, it was, it was tough and it was windy and it was cold the year that I played. And I mean, if you play all the par fives at two under for the week, I mean, you're doing pretty good. You're doing pretty good. I mean, cause I always felt like that whole people would always say it favors the long hitters. Well, it, it only favors the long hitters because they can hit three wood. Like that's, that's, that's to me was like why it favored the long hitters because they don't need to hit driver. And it's a really yeah. hard, it's a really tricky shot with a driver because you, drivers just don't, you know, I'm talking about in modern golf, like since the Pro V1 came out, the ball doesn't sling around the corner like it used to. Like you could pound one and still fling it out in the right trees. You see more guys yeah. in those right trees than ever. Um, yeah. Not so, to mention too, like just depending on, I mean, 
listen, like if you're a if you're a PGA Tour player, right, and you're kind of used to that setting, and you're used to turning shots on command, and thirty thousand fans, probably more. I don't know what it is, but like you know, you're used to that setting, and that's really the one place of the golf course where you're not kind of there's not a ton of people or patrons on top of you. Um, I just don't, I, I don't, I'm not as comfortable hitting like a, like a slinging draw on right. command. And, um, and I just never, I was just like, like you pick and choose your battles. Right. And this, now that was one of those where it's like, listen, I'll try and hit a draw. But if I don't like, I was very comfortable with the concept of like, if you don't pull off the shot, like that's not the end of the world. Right. Because that's the cool thing about that golf course is if you do jack it up off of your tee shot, you can recover. Like you can, yeah. there, there is ways out at Augusta. It's not like a U.S. Open where you're just, you're done. Yeah. Um, well, in, um, in, oh, it, it's David Frost. Where is it? It's right there. Hang on. In, uh, who is it? Hang on. The book is literally right here and it's like in my little cupboard that I've read. Um, it's called Making of the Masters. And, um, you know, it's, um, it's just, it, it goes throughout. It's really exhaustive in a really cool way if, if you're into it. And I highly recommend it to, to anyone, but um, it really kind of talks about how one of, um, you know, Alistair McKenzie or Dr. McKenzie's, uh, you know, initiatives kind of throughout the course was like, as a, better player it's still equally as challenging as it is for someone that doesn't have as much skill mm -hmm. like there's not a tremendous amount of force carries 12 is really the only one like you can run the ball up on pretty much any hole like it gives you the chance to take on as much risk as you want but at the same time like to score really well you have to take on more risk and you have to like be comfortable hitting a riskier shot right um you know anyway everyone in woke golf twitter has their own you know, thoughts and, you know, on angles and statistics and all that type of stuff. I personally think that like, if you, from a visual standpoint, if you're more comfortable with the shot, you're probably going to pull or, you know, make a, a more aggressive swing with better execution. Right. So just like, you know, like when you like, just from an angle perspective, right? Like on eight, for example, you know, depending on where the pin is on the green, like, you know, you can put it, you know, further up the right side, you know, if you like to go for it versus, you know, maybe laying up a little bit shorter. I just, and there's a lot of, there's a lot of places on that golf course where depending on what you're comfortable with, you know, maybe you give up some risk in one shot, but then you have to take it on in the next or vice versa. So um, it's just, it's, it's very masterfully designed and anyone that is kind of, I'm not by any means like a golf course, like aficionado or anything like that, but I do find it interesting. And I think it's, um, you know, if nothing else, it's, it's just, it's, it's really kind of amazing how it's kind of withstood the test of time. Yeah. Without, without doing much to it. I mean, they, they tiger tiger proofed it or what the hell you want to call it, you know, 20 years ago, whenever that was, but like, sure. That's not, they didn't do all that much to it. They moved some of the tees back and changed a couple of the angles on some of the tee shots, but it's not like they added a thousand yards to the golf course. They added, it's 400 yards longer now than it was when, he yeah. dusted it and most most golf courses are 400 yards longer now you know just by by proxy it's funny it's funny when you know people always talk about like tiger proofing it and all that it's like well tiger at his a game back then was so much better than everyone else right so like it wasn't only like this distance is obviously like he was a beast off the tee but like he put on an absolute clinic for the last 63 holes right like and it wasn't with his driver either the funny thing he was driving the ball really well but it was his iron play and his putter that it's killing yeah. everybody. They should have made the greens tougher. <laughs> uh, well, yeah, it's, it's, I mean, it was, um, anyways, no, I'm, I'm with you. Um, okay. So you, so what was your first, um, so you get to the Monday's kind of the first day you go out with practice round. So it's always famous. You have these weird groupings that happen. Like Freddie will go out with tiger and you know, somebody else. And there's all these little, you know, kind of clicks that go out together uh, for the cameras. Who did you play with? Monday. I didn't play because okay. there were storms throughout that whole year. It was cold and it was windy. Oh, that's and right. Yep. There were storms and um, it was just, it was wild. And I just didn't really want to get stuck out on the golf course and like play like two or three holes and then like go and like, you know, quarantine basically. basically yeah. I was like, I would rather practice and prepare that way. I think, cause like in a moment in 30 minutes, you, you could have been pulled off the golf course. 
Right. And I just felt more comfortable kind of practicing. Um, I love to practice, you know, even when I'm home and it just, it made more sense to me from an efficiency standpoint. Okay. So you go practice on Monday. I think I, I remember that. I remember that week now. So then Tuesday, Tuesday was a little rough. I it didn't get sunny until Wednesday, Thursday, if I remember, if I recall. So what was Tuesday like? I think Tuesday, I think you're one day behind. Tuesday was all right. Tuesday was all right. Okay. Tuesday was all right. I, um, I played with Adam Scott and Thomas Peters and I had had a lunch that day and we were going to play the front nine and I was, I had gone and had like an hour long lunch and then um, the plan was like, you know, to go out and play after that. So I knew it was going to be a little tight, but I, um, this lunch was on the books for like three weeks and I, it was with my host that I went down there with and I was just like, I, I have to do this. Right. Um, so it's actually kind of funny because I, I really wanted to play with Adam Scott. I've been a huge fan of his game and just I means the nicest yeah. guy. And obviously Scott. we were both on team broomstick. So that was, right. <laughs> that was cool. Um, yeah. So I see him on the range and we were introduced to a, a mutual friend and, um, and he was like, Hey, like, you know, let's play on Tuesday and we'll go at like one. And I was like, is there any way it can be two? And then it's like, as soon as I said it, I was like, you're such an ass. Like you're asking a master's <laughs> champion to accommodate you and he was like he was so sweet he was like yeah of course like that's awesome and stevie was there was on the bag he was just like, yeah like hey not a problem all good you know this is you know it's a stress-free i'm like okay man like i'm just so sorry <laughs> <laughs> so funny so we get uh, out there and as i said like i pretty much like only play fades let alone like under pressure like fades turn into wipey slices right and I get to the first tee. I'm like, where is he? And he like calls me over. He's on 10. He's like, hey, we're going to play the back nine instead. I'm like, no. No, 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 no. I've been hitting this little cutter out there yeah. all day. Dude. I was looking at aiming down nine <laughs> and just wiping one, you know, and um, you can't really do that on 10. So anyways, um, yeah, it was it was cool. And somehow I got it off the, the 10th tee. And I think the iron shot I put into like, you've never noticed, but there's some bushes that are just – next to the 18th green and I think I'd put one in there I didn't even bother looking for it I was like <laughs> and um anyways yeah That's so we so did that funny. and uh, it was okay. cool yeah it was him and Thomas Peters and then on on Wednesday which is traditionally the, the day of the par three contest um that was canceled our year because of weather okay so I did have a clip well I knew there was another bad day in there somewhere so and, yeah okay so it was with Jordan and Kucher so you're, but you were paired up with Jordan and Kucher in the par three or in the. No, no, no. In the, first, uh, that, that morning, that morning, no, that morning on Wednesday, we just played oh. the front nine together. Okay. So. God, there's I have so many questions. I want to make sure this, should, this doesn't take two hours. You're okay. good. Fire them all off. So. Okay. So talk, talk to me a little bit about the practice facilities. I'm going to get this out of the way quickly because people ask me, we, we get to see them on TV like crazy, but like how good are the practice facilities? And, you know, what, is it like out of body experience good? Or is it like, oh, this, this is pretty awesome. Or is it like everything is hyped up to be? Talk to me about it a little bit. I mean, from, as, as I think I mentioned earlier, you know, your sensory overload that week is so overwhelmed. Um, I mean, shoot, the coffee is the greatest coffee I've ever had. You know, so my my impression of the of the practice facility the way that they kind of very seamlessly um you know made certain shots depending on where you are on the range kind of fit certain holes um you know 13 or uh or 10 or no no 13 and 7 were the ones that i can kind of vividly remember 9 was one too where it, it like certain trees and things in the distance kind of like correlate to different shots out on the course um I mean, that's, it's, it's just really cool the way that they were able to kind of create that and that visual, um, yeah. from the chipping green perspective and the, and the putting greens. Um, yeah, I mean, they're, they're great. They're, they're very similar to how the course is and, you know, they're, they're perfect. Like everything else is, um, you know, it's, someone said, uh, uh, when I was there, it's, it's, it's really impressive. And he said it very you know, succinctly. And it's, it's really impressive more than anything else, how Augusta National and the membership continues to kind of reinvent and innovate, you know, just the overall experience for the members and the players and the media and the patrons and, 
you know, TV and it's just, it's, it's wild and it's so impressive. And, um, you know, the members, I mean, you're, you're the purpose of the practice facility is to go into practice and hit balls yet. They've like created this practice facility really tailor made, you know, to kind of for, meet the for, course and to give you the opportunity to go out and play well. And it's just, it's really cool. Well, that, and they've also tailored it for TV that like the, the driving yeah. range is, is a television show. I mean, with all the data that you can collect off of watching guys hit balls and um, you know, Augusta national, like once again, I've never been there. Augusta national like lives and absolutely succeeds in the nuance. Like they don't yeah. make wholesale changes. It's the little stuff that they get you with. It's just a little thing here and it's in the coverage or how they present it, or it's always something and it's always something tiny, but that adds up really quick. And it's like, they, yeah. you know, it's not like all of a sudden you show up and everybody's wearing red coats and it, you know, they don't do stuff like that. It's just all in the nuance. Like just it's little, just, yeah. I mean, it's crazy. It's fast. They just, they continue to kind of set the standard and um, it's, they're the, it's, they're the it's Mac, real testament. To me, they're like the Mac computers of, of it's a stupid analogy, but they're like Mac. Like they just, you know, it's, it's, it's just a 5% better every year. Every year it's 5% better. Never going to blow 1% you better every year. Yeah. It's just crazy how good that is. Yeah. Um, okay. So you're on the first tee. So you get there. Okay. So this, let's walk through the first round. Not the whole shot for shot, just you personally. Thursday morning, I think you had uh, you had a you have a morning tea time. Usually, a mid M guy goes off in the morning, right? Because it's USM's mm -hmm. in the afternoon. So, wake up five thirty a.m. You know, we can start the night before when I had to like basically roll out and be alone for like two and a half hours just so I could mentally prepare. <laughs> yeah, let's start there. Okay, so the night before the first round, what happens? So the night before, I mean, obviously we you know we were sent back um, a little early. Um, just because of storms in the area, and I think it was probably like three, three thirty ish, where it like kind of hit me. It was like you're gonna play in the one tournament that you've dreamed of your entire life, like tomorrow you're teeing it. Um, right. And just like it was, I don't know, it wasn't midlife crisis situation, but I had I had I had really made kind of a conscious effort for months, like months rather than being intimidated and scared and just overwhelmed by the moment to try and look at it a little more in the sense of like, you know, everyone that you've ever been around that, you know, friends, family, whatever it may be, you know, what an amazing opportunity to go play your favorite golf course in the world. Something you've always kind of looked at, you know, with just such on revere and, you know, to go on to play that in the one tournament that means anything more, than anything else, you know, in, in front of those people that, you know, are, are there to support you. And it's just, it's, it's special. So right. I really tried to focus on like kind of the positivity and just the, the, you know, the energy of that. So I think that was helpful, but um, no, I, I definitely like rolled out in my room for like two hours. I mean, I put on like the most soothing, calming music I could think of. Um, <laughs> like I, it was, yeah, it was, um, it was cool. I think I listened to the rumors album like twice all okay. the way through okay like I, I i think five for fighting was on like anything that was like remotely calming and you can judge me however you want but like right like it was it was um so that was that was neat and then i woke up and went in and um that morning arnold palmer had passed away um the year before so they were having the ceremony and uh i think they were doing that at like 7 45 or 8 o'clock and it was right in the middle of kind of the warm-up routine Right. And the political play was 100% to go. Yeah. Absolutely. But, you know, I, I kind of had a self-talk with myself and, <clears throat> you know, I, what I, the conclusion I kind of came to was, you know, if you had asked Arnold Palmer at his prime, you know, what he would want you to do, it Same wouldn't range. be to be there. It'd be like, no, get your ass out there, right. get ready for that first round. Cause right. you don't know if you're going to get this chance again. So, um, and if you disagree with me, that's fine. That was just my take on it. And that was <laughs> I, I, I'm pretty good buddies with Rocco Media, and he probably would have agreed with you. He'd probably like, no kid, you stay on the get on the range and get your shit together before you go tee off. Like that's yeah, I, right. Yeah. I mean, I don't. I genuinely don't think there's a right or a wrong answer. Um, I, that was just what I. That was my approach. He made, he made a choice. Okay. Yeah. Exactly. Totally. <laughs> so, so that was that, and then um, so I went out and um, 
I, I can tell the story because I've laughed at them about it since. So I was paired with Larry Mize and Brian Stewart. And we go out and as I've said a couple of times, like I hit fades, right? So I was aiming down the left side of the fairway and I was just small target, hit it hard. Right. Right. In case you hit it or whatever. Right. And um, so I had this like this uh, like a TV tower in the distance. That was my target. And it was like a good five yards into the rough. Okay. Like knowing it would cut, right? And if you you hit it straight, so be it. But I like that was what we were focused on. So Larry goes and you know, looking perfect in his like cashmere purple sweater, you oh, know, yeah. just the pros lace, pro. <laughs> yeah, the pros pro <laughs> yeah. laces one down the middle, like all of 250. Right. And it's blowing hard into off left at probably like 1030. Okay. And it's like, I mean, it's it's blowing like 20, 25. Okay. Like anything sub 74 is a hell of a round. So how Charlie Hoffman shot 65, like I will never understand. Like that's doesn't make sense. That's not me. golf. Yeah. Okay. Not golf. <laughs> so Brian Stewart goes up and he's also playing in his first masters and like, he's a pro and he's on the PGA tour, but like you can tell like nervous energy, like he's, he's nervous too. Like this is something he's, you know, dreamed of his entire life. And he goes up and he went over it for definitely a second or two longer than maybe anticipated. Okay. And again, we've, we've talked about it since we've laughed about it since, but he hit this ball so far, right? Like onto Washington road, probably up into Tennessee. Okay. <laughs> he ended up making like seven or something. Um, he made the cut too. We all, all three of us made the cut, but um, after he hit it, I, I watched it and I was like, Oh my gosh. Oh, like, no, 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 yeah. no, 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 yeah. no, no, yeah. So I, I saw it, I saw it. And uh, I think he fully like hit a provisional off the first tee. And, um, but I, I saw this thing and I was like, Oh boy, well that target that was down the left rough, like I fully, like I, I almost had to move. I mean, like, at the, yeah, just, I mean, at the, the left, the left, the left <laughs> bunker, the left bunker on nine green and hitting it as hard as I can and hoping it goes that way. Yeah, yeah, no, and um, I ended up putting it. I don't think I was in the pine straw, but I think I was close, and I ended up making bogey, and I was off. But um, anyways, yeah, I was it was pretty funny. Okay, so I think you shot seventy four your first round. So you're repaired to those guys again going into uh, into Friday in the afternoon. Obviously, the, the golf course plays different morning to afternoon. So the afternoon you get. Temperatures go up, wind goes down, it gets a little funky in the main corner, but you don't have that morning stiff, cold breeze. A little, little easier to play golf, a little more relaxed setting, I would say, probably Friday afternoon. Is, is that kind of how it was, or was it not that? I mean, I want, I want to sit here and agree, but it, I'm not going to pretend it wasn't in the back of my mind that Midams had made the cut at the Masters. Right. Um, Jay Sigel and um, what's his name from uh, from Illinois? It's, uh, he's gonna kill me. He's like a four time Walker Cupper and a captain. Um, it'll come to me. Um, okay. But um, anyways, no, there, there's two mid ams that have, that have made the cut um, in the. You know what? This is really bugging me. I have to. I I can't. You can cut this if you want. It's 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 a mid-am. They started letting the mid-am guys in like what, eighty nine or something like that. It's probably thirty years they've been doing it. Eighty three, I think it was. Bobby Lewis, boom. Oh wow, okay. So it was it was Jay and and Bobby Lewis, and um, but they had made it playing under the Walker Cup exemption. Okay, which they don't have anymore. They don't have anymore, and I knew that. So, like, it wasn't weighing on the back of my mind, but it was definitely there. Okay. So, no, I mean, it, it, I was nervous for sure. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, I, I had an okay warm-up routine, if I remember right, and went out and got off to a decent start. Um, I, l I laced one on one. I remember that. That was cool. I, I had a really good drive on one. So that was very helpful. I think I parred one, two, and three, and then hit it to like a foot and a half on four, and then made like an 18 footer for birdie on five. Five's a tough, five's, a, five's like low key tough hole in that. Like especially, not even low key, man. Not even low key, but it doesn't, yeah. get, it doesn't get its due. It's everybody talks about some of these other holes. I've always felt like the ball busters on that golf course are like five, 
Seven can be funky. Ten's tough. Um, but they, everybody talks about the, you know, the, the famous, you know, the famous holes. Like, you know, Eleven's, in my opinion, the hardest hard. one. Yeah. Right. Um, no, I, the green on five is so tough to hit. <clears throat> It's so you're, tough, and you're 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 going in there with a four or five iron. Right? I mean, you're going there with a long iron if you don't if you don't catch your drive. I had a really good drive, and I had a really good drive, and it was warmer, and it was it's kind of it's in an area of the golf course that's kind of protected. Okay. And um, I vividly remember because I went out in the afternoon. It was windy that morning too because the storm had gone through, and it was still blowing, but. Um, the cameras were brought out and I was at one over and I guess at one point I guess at one point I was at like t4 oh god and I was never on the big board I never got to see myself on the big board which oh that which sucks. was yeah it's okay um I don't like that no it's all good but uh I had a nice I don't know what it was maybe a seven or eight iron um it's like 18 feet made that and that got me pretty jacked up um so yeah when when did you ever have a moment especially in the first first couple of days because you always like especially when you play nervous golf and what i mean by that is like tournament golf like i played tournaments oh i know what nervous golf feel yeah, yeah <laughs> I, played in state, I played in state ams and stuff like that and pngas yeah and that coast and so i've played enough pressurized situations to know but there's like that moment and it only happens typically when you're sort of a fish out of water and first time you play at the masters you're a fish out of water like nobody's ready for probably that. are the second, third, fourth day. <laughs> right. But nobody's ready for that. But there's a there's that part of you that settles in. There's a moment when you sort of like, okay, I've made a few pars. The stew hagstead that I know is actually in my body now. And yeah. now I'm playing golf. You have that moment. When did that moment happen? You're like, okay, fuck, I can make some birdies. I can go play golf. Now like all the bullshit's so, out of the way. When did that happen? So after after seven the first day, Nico probably told you this. So okay. except I, I, I'm sure I've told Nico this. So after the first day, like it was playing really tough, like, right. like blowing at like three layers on, like it was, it was really tough. Stupid. Yeah. And I, I wasn't hitting it my best. And like, again, like sensory overload, like the whole thing. And I, uh, I hit it, I hit it right on seven and chipped it like into the front bunker and then hit like a pretty darn good, no, like literally and hit like a pretty darn good bunker shot to like four, four and a half feet. And I think I was, let me think about this. And I, was, and I made that to go to stay at one over. And I was like, if it's blowing 25 and, you know, it's cold and like you've gotten through that first stretch at one over, like you're going to do, you're going to be okay. Right. Cause you got a par and, five coming up. You got a, you know, you got a shortish par four coming up. You know, right. Yeah. That was the moment right. where I was like, like walking off of seven, it was like, if you can make some competent swings and you can keep it in front of you and you can just grind this out, like you can shoot an okay number. Ah, uh, see, like I, I can, I've never like obviously never been there, but it's like, I can, I could probably feel that moment of like, especially when you know you're going to make the cut. Because there's that moment like, okay, I made it into the Masters, right? I made oh, it I'd, here. I was not confident that I was going to make the cut literally until I hit like one of those really cool ones on Friday that you see where it goes up the slope and then comes back and like right. I almost made it. Like it like looked over the edge. I'd like a one, maybe one and a half footer for birdie on 18. And I literally like until it was after, I was like, okay, like we're good right i made it i made it in yeah. I, only two only two amateurs made it in right wasn't it it was you and another guy who was battling battling at the at the end and we'll talk about sunday in a second but it, it, there's only a kid two named people. curtis luck who had won the usam and the asian pacific amateur he's an australian kid yeah was the number one ranked amateur in the world by pretty significant margin okay um really yeah. good i remember him long he's got long hair his hair was in a ponytail yeah okay yeah. i know who he is okay so so then you make the cut, you go home. I think it's, it's probably fair to say that you're a completely different golfer going into – now that you've made the cut. Oh, my gosh. You're a completely different golfer showing up Saturday morning. Not only do you feel like you belong there, but you've made the cut. Like, and there's professionals, people you look up to that didn't make the cut. So now you're there. I don't know about belong there, but um, I, let's put it this way. A big weight had been lifted. Okay, fair enough. 
So yeah. who do you tee off with? Because you weren't that far out of it. I mean, you're so you're plus you're plus three going into the weekend. You're probably what ten? You're eight or nine shots back of the leaders. I think Charlie Hoffman backed it up with like seventy or sixty nine. I'd have to go back and look, but I think he I think he went pretty low and just bullied the ten shot rule. Okay, but you're um, but you're, you're not you're not. I think it was T18. I think it was T18. Okay, so you're like in the middle of the groups. Like you're not, you know. I was very comfortable with where I was at. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. So who do you who do you who are you team off with? I played with Brian Stewart again on Saturday. <laughs> which which and ever so like everyone no 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 everyone's like oh my gosh like it's too bad you didn't play with like you know Ricky or Dustin actually Dustin didn't play that year either because that was the year he like pulled out so like Ricky or JT. I'm like, no, 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 no. Let's be clear about this. Besides my friends and immediate family and his friends and immediate family, no one gave a shit about us. It right. was great. Well, he's, you guys are comfortable. You guys are comfortable with each other too. So it might have made your life a little easier to play. Because if, if you would have get, gotten there T18, at T18 is a pretty good shot. You're going to have some, somebody gnarly show up in your group. Like that's, there's a, there's Rory watch, Phil watch. Like, I think like, I think like <laughs> Louis Eustazen was like more or less around where we were. Like I definitely saw Phil, I think on the putting green, like as, as I was teeing off, he was a few ahead of me, but like, God. Oh yeah. hundred percent. It's so weird. It's like just talking about it. Cause it's always talk. It's always weird talking to people that actually played Augusta, but somebody that's actually played the Masters is to me still <laughs> so bizarre. Okay, so I think you shoot seventy four that day. I'm going to ask this question because it's a quick answer. Of all the four days, what day did you play your best golf? Were you like I hit it good? I chipped it. Like I, I played well. Like I hit it well. I was proud of how I played. Want day one. Day one. Was it because the conditions were so tough and you still held it together? Not thing? just the conditions, but just mental expectations you put on yourself um just the moment how bright the lights were how tough it played as you said um you know a lot of people ask like you know what's the best you've ever played and you know most people would look and say oh well it's the masters right and it's like no it's nowhere near the best ever played but like given the situation and the lights and the stage and I mean, it's easily the best I've ever scored. Um, and I, I like I've, I've scored better, obviously, but I, I think, you know what I mean? Like I bogeyed 11 all four days. Um, in my, for my personal standards, you know, I, I didn't particularly hit it super well, but okay. like from a course management standpoint and from a managing expectation standpoint and just from an overall like mental kind of where you were in that moment standpoint, like I was, I was very proud of kind of how I handled it. It's like golf, your golf, golf IQ was a, was an A plus that week. I guess. Totally. Yeah. Okay. You nailed it. Yeah, totally. That's very well said. Yeah, exactly. What, what was the shot that you remember the most? Like what was the, what was your best shot? I remember what I remember the most, okay, um, but it wasn't a that? golf shot. What was that? That was hugging my, my mom and dad when I got done. As low amateur? Yeah. Wow. Cause like my first memory of the masters was, you know, Tiger kind of walking off the green and hugging, you know, his, hugging old his dad man. back in 97. And I mean, it was obviously nowhere near as. I forget. I you were like, fuck, dude, you were what, 10 years old when that happened? 11 years old? How old are you? 20, you're 30 Six. now? I was born in 91. Yeah, bro. Yeah. God, I'm so old. I am so old. My birthday's on Thursday. I feel the same way. I'm 15 years older than you are. Yeah, but you look, but you look younger than that. So that's important. I don't feel younger. Uh, okay, so okay, so yeah, so I was <laughs> I was six, and you know that was kind of one of my first my first memories of it. And um, you know there, there was a lot of cool moments, and I can run like shoot, I can run through per round. You know ones that I I remember and that I hit like, you know in the final round I made an awesome lag putt on 13, and I made an epic birdie on uh, on 14. Um, on 16, the final round, I hit this perfect little fade right at the pin. It was going to go up the hill and come back and have a look at, you know, at a one and it stays there. And I'm like, I waited my whole life to hit that shot and it doesn't, it didn't do what I wanted. I did it. It was a flat shot I hit on 15. Um, 
I had an insane bunker shot on 16 on Saturday, I think it was. You know, I just even little ones like you know where you, you chipped out you know on 11 you know you had the chance to go for it but you elected to to kind of make more of of a conservative play like there's so many little where was the flag on on Saturday 16 the flag was like it's like middle right right don't they put it up by that that bunker that's up on the right or they yeah like, yeah so maybe I was thinking of the one maybe that was the one on on Friday on Friday I um hit it in the one place you can't hit it back bunker back bunker Okay. And I left the bunker shot short, like eight feet short. Yeah. Like supposedly, and I don't remember obviously because I wasn't watching, but supposedly like announcers and like TV commentators were like, that's not possible. Wow. I like, I hit like a, like a three foot dumpy spinny flop that landed in, in the, like in the fringe and like rolled out and like literally watching it. I was like, come on. Like, like I could have a hundred balls and not do that again. Did you make the putt? No, I missed the putt. God damn it. Okay. I know, I know, I know. It's um, only cool. It's only cool if you make the putt. So if 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 somebody was to give you put your game in a nutshell for the Masters that week, what did you do well that got you to to the result that you got, which is low amateur? Did you think well? Was it your short game? Was it a little bit of everything? Like what what can you point to? Yeah, no, I um I mean, I'll, I'll say the same thing, you know, I said then, um, you know, I, I thought really well, I had right. a really good game plan that I, I committed to really well. Um, I played kind of within myself. I didn't, I didn't do anything crazy or, um, or really risky. I, I wasn't conservative or risky per se, but I was just, I played very, very smart and very patiently. And, um, you know, I, I made, you know, a, a few really good bogey putts you know, from five, five feet, six feet, right. um, you know, which, which, which is important. Um, you know, I just, I, I prepared really well, you know, I, a lot of that isn't from the golf side, it's mentally, it's kind of, you know, when, when young kids go and they, and they play well in, in tour events and it happens every, you know, few years and, you know, the media asks them, you know, what were your expectations this week? And they sit there and it's like, well, you know, I'm playing my best. I think I can come out here and win. Right. Like if your expectations are anything but that, like you're in the wrong place. Sure. And, and obviously like, you know, there's the famous, you know, interview with Tiger and, um, was it a singer? Curtis Strange. It's Curtis he, Strange. He says you'll Curtis learn. Strange. Yeah. Like the, the you'll learn interview, like that's right. fine. And, and I get that. And I get both sides of that. 100%. So do I. When, like, I understand why Curtis said it to him because everybody was thinking the same thing. Like, you might be able to do it, but you don't say it out loud. Totally, totally. Yeah. But like, you genuinely have to believe that you're gonna go out there and you're gonna kick names or kick ass and take names. Right. Right. Like, like uh, Kupka said it like what, like six months ago. Like, if your expectations are to make the cut or to top twenty-five or to top ten or whatever, like your actions are probably gonna more or less reflect that. Right. So if you genuinely believe that you're that you're good enough not only to compete but also to win, like from a mental standpoint, like if your name is fortunate enough to get on the big board and you see yourself up there, you know, with the best in the world, you sit there and you go, well, damn it, I belong here. Right. So it's, it's not, I mean, I've said for a long time, like golf is so hard. It's so hard. Right. And if your biggest flaw is that you have a little too much cockiness in yourself or confidence in yourself, whatever it may be. I'd take that. Yeah. Like, shoot. <laughs> You better believe in yourself because no one's going to do it for you. Well, no, and it's it requires that though. Like you know, I I also think people because golf golf to me, how you are on the golf course is typically how you function in life, in my opinion. Like how you handle yourself on the golf course because you have to think about what you have to deal with on the golf course. You have to deal with your ego. You have to deal with you know success. You have to deal with ultimate failure. You have to deal with embarrassment. You have to deal with losing money, making money. I mean, every you can find out so much about a person from how they are on the golf course. Typically, how totally. they are on the golf course is how they are in real life. They're selfish on the totally. golf course. They're assholes in real life. So, having said that, like, if I have somebody that I'm playing with that, especially good players, and this is a, to bring up Nico. This is where he lacked. Like we've talked about this a lot. Like he's not a big enough dick. I've to listened speak. to your podcast and I've told him this before. So keep going. Right. So in that scenario, you're at the masters 
and you are granted you are a working man you are you know you're not trying to go play you know on the pga let's tour. let's 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 clarify something real quick if anyone claims that they're working as a midi playing under that exemption going into the event maybe you're in the office two or three days a week right because there is so much that goes into that tournament that right. goes in like whether it's traveling to get there and i'm not saying like you know like full time or anything like that but like no but telling, people, are, like, people are hustling out of the office to catch a flight you know sunday night to go to augusta and go i haven't i haven't touched my clubs in five weeks like that yeah is. like no but no 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 and, and and that's in no way like I, i'm i'm gonna get raked over the coals on this on social media or something for sure but like like that's there's so many little things like like you don't just not like there's there's no mid am events you know really from the beginning of october until april so you know you play the jones cup which is at the tail end of january Right. Maybe you play the Azalea that's the week before. Like, there's just not that many events that you can kind of gear up to get ready for it. So right. there's just, the reality is, is like, to your point, like, it's not like you're leaving the office like early on a Friday to go bang balls and then you practice on the weekend. Like, no, 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 there's, you're, you're, you're going up against the best college kids in the world. Right. And the best pros in the world. And you better, and and up against every fear, every hope, every wish, everything that you've ever wanted in your whole life is literally. And you're also representing every single competitive golfer that has graduated from college and doesn't play professionally. Right. That's what's on your back. Right. It's a lot. So I, it's I, I, I don't know. I um, yeah. It's, but I don't. Uh, but, I just wanted to clarify that. <laughs> well, no, that's fine. But the, like the point, the point is. I guess the point I'm trying to make is like, like I had mentioned earlier about you um, sort of relaxing and putting pressure on yourself or something, I forget what the comment was, but it's like, you know, at some point, and I, I guarantee this happened, at some point you probably got lost in yourself, meaning like you're walking up, you're, it's Saturday, you're playing well, you're not like in last place, you're not struggling you're not some amateur that's out of place just like no i'm playing with these guys i'm playing my game i'm making some birdies i'm in the like i'm not in the hunt i'm not leading the tournament but i'm like i'm beating a bunch of other professionals that was sunday on in the fairway on 10. okay this week this week Stu Hag so, was a good like so, good play yeah so on sunday um i mean it was perfect like there literally wasn't a cloud in the sky and I knew I was like in the hunt for low am, but candidly, like it wasn't a goal that week. Like it wasn't really on my mind. Like my goal was to finish in the top 12, which was to get you an invite back to next year. Right. So my caddy JD came up and um, I'd kind of righted the ship. Let's see. I, uh, I bogeyed one, hard or birdied two. I think I was like one or two over. I mean, I'd have to go back. I think I was two over. I birdied eight. And then uh, maybe it was three over. Shoot, I don't remember. Okay. Anyways, um, the point of that is like, JD asked me, he's like, hey, do you want me to go find out where we're at? You know, as far as like the low amount of race. I was like, honestly, like we're playing in the Masters on Masters Sunday. Like there's literally not a cloud in the sky. My birthday is tomorrow. Like whatever he shot whatever Curtis shot like is going to have no effect over on how well I want to play right like let's just go out and let's let's do let's let's throw everything we have at this back nine let's shoot the best score we can just kind of let the cards fall where they are okay and um I birdied 10 bogeyed 11 I parred 12 I birdied 13 and 14 um I parred 15 I bogeyed 16 that's the one I mentioned where I like yeah. oh, it's devastating and then I parred 17 and 18 and like walking up to the green on 18, I guess JD had gone to one of, you know, a friend in the crowd and kind of like, Hey, like, you know, where's, where's Stu? And he knew that I think I had like a four shot lead right hit the green. And, um, and after I hit the shot on 18, he was like, Hey, do you want to know where you stand? Oh yeah. Yeah. Like, you know, where am I at? He's like, you four shot lead. Enjoy this this walk up and that was Dude. that was pretty cool that yeah cool. i mean and because that you know because then you're done you're low amateur so like you're the gold medal winner for that for your <laughs> for your flight which is the amateur flight which is still impressive 
But then you get, but what you get to do after that though, like you get to go in the Butler cabin with Sergio and sit down and experience that, right? Like you get to go and for the green jacket ceremony out on the, you know, you know, when it's dark out and that little ceremony that nobody really gets to see on TV and you get to be a part of that. And then you get to go to dinner with everybody. I mean, it's just, what did it you, after, after you get done, um, I went back with my family and, uh, we had a whole bunch of wine, a sure. whole bunch of cocktails and a whole bunch of beers and some food. And I have no idea how many people were there that night, but, um, I woke up the next day with easily the best hangover I've ever had. Oh yeah. Of course you did. Cause it's your birthday. Isn't it? It's kind of, kind of unfair that your birthday falls on what I would call the greatest week of the year. To me, it's the greatest week of the year. Baseball starts it's master's week, final four, there's I'm missing there's something else in that week. It's like everything. Uh, oh, everything oh, I, yeah. You said final four. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Everything I care about happens in that one week. And then your birthday's that week. Like that's unfair. It, it was cool. You know, and it's, um, it's funny. I, I kind of say somewhat jokingly, like whoever I end up getting married to, or, you know, have kids and all that stuff. Like, you know, that's kind of supposed to be like, you know, the best week of, of your life. And, you got a real tough one to beat, so definitely won't say that at the uh, the reception. But um, uh, you might want to put that in a journal and just write it down, just to say, like, yeah. just, just for the record, everybody, that was the best week of my life. Yeah, you know, hopefully, whoever I end up getting married to, their their dad plays golf, and he's like, no, man, I totally get it. You're good. Yeah, you need you need well, you need to find an you need to find a girl that's the daughter of one of these members at LAC, uh, somebody that understands the game. Um, uh, we'll talk about that next time we talk. But, just, um, yeah, sounds good, bro. Have a good week. Take care of yourself. Wash your hands, and uh, I'm sure we'll be ch uh, texting uh, and chatting soon. Sounds good. Thanks, Thanks man. Bye. See you soon.